I've been thinking for the past uh, couple of years, I guess, about the three revolutions that made the world that all of us live in. The first, it goes back quite a ways, back to maybe 1397 when the Medicis found the first bank. It's the financial revolution. The first revolution that made the, mo the modern world was when wealth shifted from being rooted primarily in land and the fruitfulness of land to being primarily found in money and the fungibility and transferability of money. So the first revolution that makes the modern world is the one where wealth moves from land to money, the financial revolution. And then we think about uh, the, maybe the best known uh, technological revolution, the industrial revolution, which is a revolution of work. And in the Industrial Revolution, we go from work, which for all of human history was done by bodies, human bodies and animal bodies, domesticated animals, tended by human beings, did all work in the world until the Industrial Revolution. And you can think of 1769 and the invention of the steam engine as the mark of this. And now work that used to be done by bodies is now done by engines. And then in the 20th century, really the middle of the 20th century, we get the next great revolution. Uh, it's the computational revolution. You can mark it by the publication of Claude Shannon's paper on the theory of information in 1948 that gives us finally a kind of mathematical and formal, formalized way to shift how we handle knowledge. And knowledge which for all of human history has been a matter ultimately of wisdom passed down from generation to generation, how the world works, how to conduct yourself in the world. And now through computation, we have a completely new kind of knowledge that we could call information. So these are our three great revolutions and they stack on top of one another. Wealth from land to money, work from bodies to engines, and then it really gets going once you have in, uh, knowledge shift from, from wisdom to information. The primary obvious result of these three revolutions has been unbelievable prosperity, of which everyone in this room is in one way or another a beneficiary. In many ways, just the fact that you're in this room means that you are a beneficiary of these revolutions. And they've generated untold wealth, in many ways untold health, length of life, quality of life, by many measures even reported happiness in the world. But I've been thinking about a paradox, which is that in the midst of all this abundance and prosperity, there seems to be something not quite right. And here's what I'm starting to think it's about. I wonder if what's going on in all three of these revolutions is a kind of trade of personhood for power. Which is to say that as we went through these revolutions, we replaced a personal form of human engagement with the world and human actualization in the world with an, an impersonal form that is far more powerful. So this is very clear in the invention of the money economy because money is basically an impersonal medium of exchange. It's a way to exchange value with other human beings without having to be embedded in relationship with them. So I go to the convenience store uh, in our part of Pennsylvania, it's called Wawa. Uh, we are very loyal to our Wawa's in uh, the mid-Atlantic states. And I walk into Wawa, sounds weird to you, but it's totally normal to me. And I'm there to get my snack and I have no idea who this person is behind the counter. Uh, I've got my Walker's shortbread or whatever. I've got my credit card or now I can just wave my phone in the general direction of the payment terminal and money is liberated from my credit account. It's not even a physical thing. It's just a set of symbolic representations of wealth. And Wawa gets what it wants, it gets the money. I get what I want, I get the snack. The cashier gets paid by Wawa. I never learn that person's name. That person doesn't know my name. Sometimes we don't even make eye contact. Sometimes I try to make eye contact, I re eye contact and I realize they're not interested in looking at me. And I assure you that there are people at Wawa working on getting rid of that counterpart person behind the counter because they're really rather vestigial at this point. It's a perfectly impersonal transaction. It's the foundation of the modern world. It's so normal to us, it's so routine, that we forget that at any other time in history, and indeed for billions of people today, the idea that you would live in this disengaged way, that all your transactions would be mediated impersonally, is unthinkable. 
Because this is the overthrow of what we would call traditional culture in which all wealth was held in personal relationship and stewarded through generations in the land that was the foundation of every agricultural society. And all work was done by persons in relationship with each other, often tending animals to whom they'd often give names and who they would care for together as family and community. And all knowledge was handed on from person to person. And now we do our work without having to be personal. We get our information. I mean, when you want to find out something, you go to Google. You don't go to another person. What do they know? <laughs> this is not the world that Jesus of Nazareth lived in. Jesus went back to his hometown to preach, and he says some kind of surprising things. And what people say in response is, this is Joseph's son. And they say that maybe with some combination of surprise and dismay, but they know who he is. In fact, they know the whole lineage of Jesus. It's preserved for us in the opening chapter of, Mar of Matthew and of Luke. They know his whole story of where he's come from. This is Joseph's son. How many of you know whose son I am? How many of you know the name of my father and my mother. We're in a room of maybe a thousand people. I believe it is the case that there may be no one in this room who knows the name of my father or my mother. You don't know whose son I am. And if you happen to know that their names are Wayne and Joyce, I don't believe there's anyone here who knows them, let alone the names of my grandparents, Homer and Alice and Asa and Anne. And the reason you don't know these names is that I'm a winner in the modern world. Because to win in the modern economy of wealth and work and knowledge is to be liberated from the conditions and connections with which you started your life. And it's to be known without being known in these embedded, connected communities. In fact, I can gauge your status in the late modern world with incredible precision by asking a simple question. How many of the people you interact with every day know your extended family? And the more people for whom you can say, yes, every day I'm with people who know where I came from, who my parents were, who my grandparents were, the lower your status, the lower your rewards in the modern world. The story of the late modern world is the trade of personhood for power. And this leads to, I think, a way to understand the great paradox of our time, the great abundance and prosperity, and yet the great sense of disease. I've had the privilege of hosting, of, over the years, guests from other parts of the world, people who uh, come from places where these three revolutions have not fully played out. And I've gotten into the habit of asking guests from Uganda or El Salvador or Southeast Asia, when they come to visit the United States, what do you notice about my country that I might not notice as someone who's lived here my whole life? And there's one answer that's just so consistent, I've come to expect it. I remember the first time I heard it from my friend Zach, who visited from Uganda. And I said, uh, Zach, what do you notice about the United States? And he said, I notice how lonely it is. And I thought, that is the most true thing I've ever heard about my culture, and I never could have said it myself. I never could have named it. But as soon as it was named, I was like, oh, this is exactly what it's like to live in this world, this lonely world of money and engines and information. Vivek Murthy was Surgeon General of the United States uh, for a number of years, just finished his term in 2017. He wrote this in the Harvard Business Review just in September of 2017. During my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease or diabetes. It was loneliness. Modernity is a great place to have power. It's not a great place to be a person. Now, here is the fascinating thing. To me, this is when the talk gets fun and interesting. So if it hasn't been fun or interesting up till now, hang on. Because actually, all three of these revolutions, in a way, happened once before. This is not actually the first time we've had these revolutions in wealth and work and knowledge. Because all three of them, in a very significant way, happened at the time of the Roman Empire. 
The Roman Empire was the first empire to systematically mint coins, to create coinage as a medium of exchange and use it throughout the empire, largely to salary the standing military that served the generals, the Caesars, eventually the, empire, uh, the emperors. The Romans, of course, didn't have engines in the way we do hydrocarbon and steam engines, but they did have engines and they had engineering. They had the ability to leverage force in ways that vastly expanded their ability to build, to construct uh, cities and, and other works of, of incredible technical sophistication for the ancient world. And because the Romans eventually conquered the whole Mediterranean Rim, they absorbed the knowledge from the world of Greece and the world of North Africa, and all that was brought into these extraordinary libraries of uh, high Roman Republican Empire. And this created incredible prosperity and incredible abundance, especially for the few whose names we still remember. The philosophers and generals and leaders and writers and poets who made a name for themselves in the abundance and the new flowering of humanity that was possible in the Roman Empire. But the distribution of personhood in the Roman Empire was profoundly unequal. Very few people were fully persons, and I mean that in a kind of literal way. Very few people were recognized as a persona, the Latin word from which we get person that's a legal term in Latin, that means someone with the full standing in law and society to be recognized as a full human being. Only the pater familias, the head of the complex Roman household, counted as a person. And everyone else lived in various degrees of personhood, from uh, children who could aspire to inherit their father's status, to women always treated as property of the paterfamilias, and then of course to maybe 20 or 25 percent of the Roman Empire who were slaves, not so much by virtue of race, but by virtue of commercial or military misfortune, who were stripped of family, stripped of community, treated as property. And one of the most interesting things is, is what happened to the names of slaves. Because the Romans were very practical people. And if you really didn't have any prospect of ever becoming a person, they didn't really bother with a name. So you were, if you were male, you were often just named by your birth order. Third, fourth, fifth, Tertius, Quartus, Quintus. Or maybe you'd have a slave born, or a baby born to a slave woman, that child would always be a slave. And so you just decided to call them useful. In Greek, Onesimus. This brings us to what is to me the most sociologically stunning chapter in the whole Bible. It's the least preached upon chapter of the most preached upon book in the New Testament, the Epistle to Romans, and it's Romans 16. And the reason we don't often preach on it is it's basically just a collection of greetings by name to a whole bunch of people that Paul knows or knows of, even though he's never been to Rome, and he wants to greet them by name. And it's an astonishing collection. Phoebe, Prisca and, Asp and, Aqu Prisca and Aquila, Andronicus and Junia, uh, Herodian, Persis, Rufus. And all of these people, G Roman names, Greek names, male names, female names, names that are clearly high status, names that are clearly low status, free names, names associated with slavery, all of them are, are kind of jumbled together in this set of greetings that Paul wants to personally connect with each of these people. And the most astonishing verse in Romans 16, to me in some ways the most astonishing verse in the whole Bible, comes near the end. And it says this, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Who is this? This is the scribe the amanuensis, the person who's been sitting, taking dictation, probably early in life, he acquired literacy, probably as a slave, he may or may not be a slave at this time, he's low status, he's there to take down in fair hand the words of free men. And at some point, Tertius realized, realizes that Paul has stopped dictating and is looking at him. And Paul says, Tertius, you should greet them. You're a brother. I... What's his name? Tertius, third. And third writes this, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, in whose house we're staying, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you, greets you. And so does our brother, Quartus. Fourth, maybe Tertius's brother. Number three, 
Number four, now staying in the home of Gaius, having meals with Erastus and all of them by name, greet by name their brothers and their sisters in Rome and hand the letter to Phoebe to take to Rome. It's a, the most astonishing moment in the Bible for me in some ways. Every one of us came into the world looking for one thing. The moment we were born, we were looking for a face. We were born and in the shock and surprise of birth, we opened our eyes and we looked for a face because until we see a face, until another sees us, we do not know who we are. And we looked for someone who would look at us. In the words of uh, the psychiatrist, Kurt Thompson, my friend, every human being, their deepest drama is looking for someone who is looking for us. And we're in this room because someone, some face found our face and locked eyes with us and we were given a name. But at some point in every human life, the gaze shifts, the face disappears. No one is looking for us, that's loneliness. And in some lives that happens very early, even just in the moments after birth, as a glance is given and then someone says, this is number three. Number four. And I imagine what it was like for Tertius to realize that Paul was looking at him, that Paul was seeing him, that he was a brother. And this was the revolutionary act of the early church. In an impersonal world, to recognize persons of every possible status, to see them all and know them all by name and name them all as brothers and sisters. Is it any wonder that the early church grew? We're not done with revolutions. The 21st century will bring the next one. It'll be the biological revolution in which life will no longer be begotten conceived in the most profound intercourse of persons. But life will be made. That will be the next frontier of power. And in an impersonal world, you know, we have lots of ways of talking about renewing and restoring culture. It comes down to something very simple. In this world, and in the world that's coming, the restoration of culture is the recognition of persons. That is what the early Christians did for Rome. It is what we must do today. Thank you.